what is going on everybody happy monday november 14th obviously we are pre-recording this but you are watching this on monday november 14th uh this is the fivefold ministry explained part two of four that's right so if you're watching this is your first one you're like part two of four you say yes there's a part one and there's going to be four total because this is a teaching series and so we always take them and we put them if you're watching on youtube we put them in the playlist and then we organize them in a nice, neat little package so that you can, you know, binge all four episodes. If someone has questions about deliverance, or they have questions about, hey, how do you hear from God? How do you, how do you, uh, how do you walk in the Spirit? How do you do all that stuff? What is the fivefold ministry? You can share that playlist, and you can send it to somebody because you're like, well, Demonte explains it way better than I do. I'm still, I'm still learning how to do that, all that good stuff. So. Yeah, uh, obviously, too, uh, if you are watching on Rumble or on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. And then if you're watching on YouTube, hit that bell notification so you never miss a moment that we go live, which is Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time. And obviously like this video, comment in the live chat, comment in the comment section if you're not watching live. Um, all that good stuff. Let us know where you're watching from. Yes, I know this is pre-recorded, but we're still kind of we're still kind of in the background watching the episode, making sure it's running properly. And so we might engage with you guys as well there. So hello, everybody. Um, and then obviously we are on Twitch. So YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Rumble. So four glorious locations. You got variety. Variety is the spice of life. This is not a numbered episode. So it will also not be converted into the audio only form. Uh, but you can go check that out anyways. Go to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, type in Elijah Fire Podcast. Boom, will pop up. We got a just a, a nice bounty for you there of many episodes. Uh, some you probably haven't even seen or heard. So check them out. And then uh, I think I think that's it because we, we got a hard 50 minutes. That's what DeMonte said. So I want to honor that. So we're going to get going on this. He, My guest today, if you don't know who he is, he's an author. He's an apostle. He's a teacher. Apostles, we talked about last episode, so check it out if you have link is in the description. If you haven't checked that one out yet, stick around for this one and then go check that one out. Uh, he's also a teacher. He's the founder of Freedom for the Nations. Give it up for my guest today, Demonte Edmonds. Demonte, welcome back. I love that intro. Thank you for having me back, Jeff. Oh yeah, Great. yeah. It really, it really pumps you up, man. <laughs> yeah, it really pumps you up. Okay, yes. so Demonte, last time you were on part one of four, we talked about apostles. What are apostles? How do they function? Are they still around today? Uh, and it's a really, it was a really, really informative, really great time, especially because apostles are kind of hard to pin down sometimes. Uh, and so I think you did a great job of explaining that, giving examples from your own experience even. So um, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to continue talking about the fivefold ministry that's in Ephesians 4 and 11. But today we're going to talk about the ministry office and gifting of the prophet, okay. the prophet's ministry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the big question that I get a lot from people is they're like, are are prophets even around today? I thought prophecy ended in the Bible, which is what a lot of even cessationist uh, teachers will talk about is they say, well, prophecy was just in the Old Testament or there was some prophecy in the New Testament, depending on who you talk to. Um, so are prophets active today, DeMonte? Yes, they are active today. And you know, I grew up where I didn't know that prophets still existed. You know, when I thought of prophets, I just thought of people that wore burlap 2,000, 3,000 years ago. And they were like these weird mystical individuals mm -hmm. uh, that would come and give you scary words that you read about in the Bible. They live unusual lives. But prophets are around today. And um, I remember I was part of a Pentecostal spirit field church. And they first announced, they said, next week, we're going to have a special guest speaker. And it's going to be a prophet. And I was so excited uh, because I have never seen a prophet, never met a prophet. Maybe I did, but I didn't know they were a prophet. And I definitely didn't know that I was a prophet. And if I did, it was locked away in my subconscious. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, I mean, I was, I couldn't wait for the next Sunday to come. And when that Sunday came, I was excited to be there. But you know what I was looking for? I was looking for the person to call down fire, you know, do something that was just supernatural, angel to manifest, something yeah, that just straight Elijah style. Yeah, I was looking for something that was overly dramatic and sensational. And I believe the Lord didn't give that purposely. What the person shared was a dream. And I'm like, a dream? Come on, you got to hit me with some heavy. I have dreams. Yeah. <laughs> but the dream spoke into the situation and the heart of the matter that was taking place. So my introduction to the prophetic was very straight laced, uh, revelatory, but also very practical. And so I believe, you know, even in our own ministry, we have a lot of what we, I guess you would call supernatural things, you know, the glory of God, angels, all of this stuff. But I try to keep it very practical as well yeah. with the teaching mm -hmm. and with sharing with people what God is doing. And so the prophet's ministry is still around today, it's still active. You know, some people use the title some don't use the title but it's all about the function of what the prophet's called to do yeah yeah so i have a question about um and i think we'll get to it but i'm going to say i'm going to ask it now and we'll just put a pin in it because i okay. had a really gr great question and i provided answers to, a friend of mine asked me a question about like how do you know that that a prophet is of of god how do you know that a prophet is is hearing accurately and i thought that was a really good question and i provided an answer but i think you might be able to provide even a better answer um no pressure but yeah we'll kind of get there i think maybe okay maybe as we're talking at the prophet then we can kind of revisit that question i kind of wanted to ask it now just to kind of keep it in people's minds so as they're listening to you talk they might see some of those pieces come together themselves so okay yes, so I'm, yeah so i'm going to just let you go and do okay. your teaching thing okay perfect perfect so i want to talk about first what is a prophet we have this word prophet um you know all five of those ministry gifts that god mentions has a specific purpose and function the prophet is the ministry gift that's especially specifically gifted in revelation whereas we talk about the evangelist wins souls the teacher is able to break down the word the pastor deals with his flock and the sheep the apostle does this governmental, managerial, supervisory type of duty uh, at a more larger scale. The prophet is specifically gifted to deal with revelation that comes from God. And what sets the prophet about from the other ministry gifts is sometimes it can seem more sensational because they are dealing with this revelation. Yeah. So number one, any prophet, whether Old Testament, New Testament, they have one thing in common is that their task to communicate the heart of the father and the mind of Christ. And so it's this saying that, you know, this is the difference between prophets and politicians. Politicians often find out what's popular with people and they get ahead of it and say, hey, this is the popular thing. Come and vote for me. Prophets find out what's popular with God, what's what's on the heart of God. And it's often what's unpopular with people. And they say, no, yeah. you need to change directions. And so the Old Testament and New Testament prophet, I'm going to get into the difference between the two, but prophets, their main assignment, I believe, is to receive from God revelation to convey his heart and mind. And sometimes his heart and mind is for an individual that he may be speaking a prophetic word a dream or vision. And I'll talk later also about different ways God communicates through the prophets. Okay. It could be for a family. You know, I've given prophetic words to families. I remember one time that uh, I was in a text conversation with my wife and one of her friends and we were texting and she just happened to mention some, uh, a young lady that she knew. And when she mentioned this young lady, Lord just gave me this vision of her family. And I said, are they from West Virginia. She said, yes. How do you know? I said, the Lord is showing me. And I said, have they dealt with a lot of poverty, miscarriages and mental breakdowns, nervous breakdowns in the family? She said, yes. I said, well, what I'm seeing is they built this property or house upon an Indian burial ground, Native American bur burial ground, first people burial ground. That was a sacred place that they use for, I'm going to use the word worship, but I'm also going to say probably idolatry. 
and because it wasn't the worship of Jesus Christ. Mm. And it brought a curse because a lot of times if you go back into medieval times or Egypt or even with first peoples or, or different groups, that if you desecrated these sacred burial grounds, there was normally a curse that would be released. Even the Bible says, don't remove the ancient landmarks. Hmm. Right. So yeah. there's some legality there. So that's a whole nother message. But anyway, the Lord actually gave me the gear that they built the house. It was really like, it wow. caught me off guard. And I began to tell her this. And she said that several people had had miscarriages. She knew that her friend had had three. She knew that at least three of them had had mental breakdowns. And I said, well, I feel the Lord is telling us that we should pray that this curse that's flowed down through their generations broken. But that is an example of the prophetic ministry being used for a family. Yeah. You know, sometimes a prophetic word is for an individual. There's a word that maybe you're praying about this person that you're dating or seeing if they're your husband, if they're your your, your wife, and a prophetic word comes and says, says, run. This tall guy that you're dating that's bald, he's a wolf in sheep clothing, run. I mean, that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. And then prophetic words can be for nations. I just was in a meeting with Apostle Chuck Pierce, and he was given a prophetic word for the U.S. He was talking about the, a vision that he saw of angels uh, guarding four gates of the United States of America and also a word that he gave for three cities in America. And so, the but the common denominator is this. There's a communication of the heart and mind of God through the prophets. And so the prophets, God speaks to them very clearly but also through diverse ways. One way that God speaks through the prophet is through the inner voice or the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty clear, that's pretty direct. Another way, prophets tend to have more visions than any of the other ministry gifts. Hmm. They tend to have more visions. There's different types of visions. There is the inner vision, like sometimes when I'm talking to someone, I can see a vision on the inside of my mind, the inside mm -hmm. of my mind's eye, the inside of my being. There's an open vision, which is on the outside of you. It's like you watching a movie or a scene from a movie or a picture, but it's on the outside of you. And some people have these dramatic open visions where the, like the ceiling opens up or the wall disappears and they're seeing this panoramic vision. Then thirdly, that's the, what I call a trance vision or uh, ecstasy. When Peter was on the roof, rooftop and he was hungry, it said that he fell into ecstasy. He fell into yeah. a trance. Mm -hmm. And he had an open vision in this trance of a sheep being let down with food. And he gets this revelation from God that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the redemptive plan of heaven, is not just for the Jews. It's not just for the Hebrews. It's not just for the children of Abraham. It is for everyone. It's for the Gentiles. It's for everyone in the world that's going to be grafted in. And, you know, God had to speak that way through strong revelation because their upbringing, their culture, their history, all of their teaching had been that they're the chosen people yep. and no one else is chosen. Mm -hmm. And so God couldn't just speak through a little inner voice and say, this salvation is for everyone because... And I don't know why the Lord's leading me here, because sometimes we need a, a dramatic revelation from God to convince us because our subconscious and what we've been taught that could be inaccurate will sometimes suppress the voice of God if it's speaking in the what I call the regular inner voice of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So anyway, the prophets are gifted with often with visions, the word of the Lord. And so it's one thing to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, but I want to say that it's heightened when it comes in what you read in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord. It would say that the prophets would say, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, you know, I know when I'm hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, but I also know when it comes as the regular leading of the Holy Spirit versus when it comes out of my prophetic mantle, I hear the word of the Lord. I remember times where I would just be in the house talking to my wife. I'll sit down and I'll get quiet for a second. All of a sudden, the word Lord began to come to me about nations and different countries. And, and I'll run and, and grab the laptop and, and just start typing like a madman because it was coming to me so fast and so rapid mm -hmm. that if I didn't type it, I thought I would miss it. And the word Lord was, was coming to me like a flood. And so 
the word of the Lord uh, accompanies the prophets hmm. as yep. well. Dreams, dreams, dreams. You know, prophets get a lot of dreams, vivid dreams, detailed dreams. We used to call my wife the dream master. I remember one time, and, and she's a prophet as well. I remember one time I prayed for like an hour and a half and I heard nothing. Jeff, I, no vision, no revelation, nothing. I didn't feel any presence. I mean, uh -huh. nothing. And I want to encourage some of you guys. Sometimes you see the results and the manifestations in people ministry, and they don't tell you about the times that they prayed and they fasted and they didn't get anything tangible. Yeah. You, it's a faith walk. Even though you may not see or hear that you receive something, if you spend time with God, you receive something. It may just be for later. That's yep. that's something else as well. Yeah, that prepare. happened to me actually recently. I I really felt strong. I was supposed to go on a three day fast, so I did, and I'm like, whoo, let's do this because my ten day fast the year prior was like explosive, right? So then I did it three day nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like i've had many of those fast all right okay well we're gonna keep going you know it was just yeah yeah so. yeah so it's it's it just be faithful to god yeah. <laughs> so i come down out of prayer and my wife was asleep on the couch and you know and so she gets up and she was like how was prayer and she tells me like three dreams that she has from god and she only been asleep 15 minutes she could fall asleep 10 minutes and get two very vivid powerful detailed wow. dreams from god wow. And I had to pray 45 minutes an hour and maybe get one, two little things. And so we began to call a dream master, but every prophet is not the same. And I'm going to talk about sure. that as well. But dreams, dreams seem to be heightened uh, and, and, and increased in depth and frequency and in detail in the prophet's ministry. Another one, if you want to take it a little bit further, is sometimes angelic activity. Not all prophets where some have an increase of angelic activity. If you go back into the Old Testament and you look at Elijah the prophet, there's a place where he's sitting on a hill and the captain of the army for Ahab is trying to take him captive. And he calls down fire on uh, 50 soldiers. He does it like twice. The third gentleman comes with his little soldiers. He already knows that there's been barbecue twice from heaven. So he gets smart. And he, he's going to beg Elijah, please don't call down fire. And it says in that verse something interesting. It says the angel of the Lord told him, go down with this gentleman. Don't send fire on him. Hmm. The God is very specific and intentional. It didn't say that God told him. It said the angel of the Lord told him. So... You see that with him. You even see it with Jesus. Jesus is called a, a prophet, mighty in word and mighty in, I mean, mighty in deeds. And you see when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying and said that the angels came to strengthen him. Even when he was in the wilderness with wild beasts, the angels came to strengthen him. And I can name other people in the Bible, uh, prophets of God, that the angel of the Lord sometimes operated in their ministry. And I was meeting with a prophet one time. And when I met with him, I told him, I said, um, the Lord just showed me two angels that work with you when you're doing crusades. I said, one stands at your left, one stands at your right, and their name is this. Now, when I said their name, I don't want you guys getting into trying to figure out angels' names because their name is not like John Tolliver that lives on such and such street. A lot of times when I get that names of angel, it's not their personal name. So I don't know them personally. It's their function. So oh, the Lord said this is the angel's name, but it's their function. It's like... The janitor. Excuse me, Mr. Janitor. You don't, he may be Mr. Smith, but he's the janitor and you just call him Mr. Janitor or uh -huh. <laughs> the clerk. Or you know, senator the clerk. or, you know, whatever. Yeah, senator, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're not trying to get, delve into figuring out the angels' names. You probably couldn't pronounce it anyway and they don't want you to yeah. know their name. Uh, but I said one on the left, I see miracles and the other name is Revelation. And what would happen, and he had pictures from Nigeria where you can almost see outline of the angels. I said, one would whisper into your ear words of knowledge for people that God wanted to heal. And they would be like very detailed words of knowledge, not just your regular level, mm -hmm. like yeah. names, addresses. And the other one would work in his ministry to bring the miracles. He had a lot of miracles. One meeting, maybe 45 deaf people heard. Come and on. so 
Um, sometimes in the prophetic ministry, depending on what you're called to do, your assignment, there may be increased angelic activity also for spiritual warfare. So let me just keep anything, Jeff, before I, I no, I keep just, going, man. This is great. Okay, okay. So the other thing I want to talk about that's very interesting is, oh, I need to say this. The Lord just jumped in on me. Sometimes prophets get in trouble because they're getting so much revelation. They're hearing so clearly they become lone rangers. Mm. They become an island unto themselves. Yeah. I've seen probably more people that were called to this office get into error, get miscued, or fall out of line with how they need to be properly aligned with the body of Christ because of their revelation. Even the apostle Paul said this, that the because of the abundance of revelation that he had, God allowed a thorn in the flesh. It helped him to stay humble Interesting. and not to get into pride, which brings the condemnation of the devil. So if you are a prophet or called as a prophet, you still need to be plugged into the body of Christ, plugged into a local assembly, plugged into some type of apostolic leadership, and you still need to be aligned and moving, uh, not alone, but as part of a collective uh, entity of ecclesia, the church, the body of mm -hmm. Christ, whichever terms that you want to use. And so one of the things the enemy does with prophetic people and prophets, especially those that are very strong, is he wants to alienate you and isolate you and you get the lone prophet syndrome. Elijah said, God, I'm the only prophet left. <laughs> and, and God said, no, I have a bunch Dude, of people no. to yeah. know about that have not bowed the knee to Jezebel and Baal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you may feel alone, maybe in your church, maybe in your community. But if you pray and ask God, God, where do I fit in? Where do I belong? He will navigate and help you find yeah. the right place. That's right. Because if now, you're, do you, uh, yes. sorry, but do you feel like, I, I mean, a lot of that can come from legitimate rejection, right? That can be the seed that Satan goes, you know, you should, yeah, distance yourself from those people and distance. But I mean, the Bible even talks about how, what is it? Uh, Jesus is a prophet is not welcome in its own, in their own oh. town or city or something like that. Um, and so it, the Bible even talks about how prophets are going to be rejected. They are rejected because what they're saying, like you're talking about earlier is unpopular. So, yes. And not only that, I believe, and now rejection is probably the biggest challenge for any prophet. Mm. Because when God begins to communicate with you in this heightened type of way, you're going to see and perceive things differently. And when you share that, oftentimes people are not going to receive it and they may separate themselves or they may treat you differently. Or, you know, I remember January the 20th, 2005. A man named Donald Wilburn gave me this word. He said, the Lord doesn't want you to take this as a rejection, but they will know. People will know that you are able to see and some will run away from you. And the Lord says, do not take it as rejection. That was one of the first prophetic words that I received that I can remember word for word. We had on a little white tape with a green sticker that the Lord prepared me. There are going to be some people, they're not going to deal with you. They're not going to invite you. They're not, they're going to run. I've been in grocery stores and people saw me and they dropped their stuff. And I mean, they took off running grown men. And oh, I was like man. in my twenties, but you have to, when people don't receive words and immaturity, and when I'm saying immaturity, it's not negative. I'm just saying that we mature over time. You can feel like they rejected you and they didn't reject you. They just rejected the word and you have to separate people not receiving what you're saying versus them not receiving you. Yeah, But, the, really good. but the, the challenge is this. If you tell someone the Lord says this and the Lord says that and they don't like it, they don't want to hear it. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Father's in heaven. You're the person that they see. They're not going to be really upset with God. They're going to be upset with you. So, <laughs> so they're going to associate that word more with you more than mm -hmm. with God because they don't want to. If they associate it with God, then they know that it's coming from God and it's harder for them to reject it. So, <laughs> yeah, so, I think, too, there's probably a, a measure of like because uh, I remember when I was in 
you know, I was raised Lutheran, but my mom took us to this. Uh, there was like a prophet at this thing. And I remember as a teenager, I'm like, please don't call me out. Please don't call me out. Please don't call me out. You know, <laughs> I'm sitting in the audience just like sweating. Please don't call me out. I don't want to be called out. Um, but uh, I think too, there may be even a recognition. Maybe it's subconscious. Maybe there's spirit. No, I don't know. But they recognize this dude, God tells him things and he's going to read my thoughts. And I'm not entirely, I'm out of alignment with the Lord. And I, you know, so then they do this where they, you know, they don't, they pretend like they don't see you or they see you and run away. So, yeah, yeah, they do that. And then, and then church services, they'll, they'll be watching you. And when you go to look at them, they'll, they'll break eye contact and look away because <laughs> they don't want you calling them out. <laughs> but then you have the people that want to be called out. And they would do everything to get your attention almost. That's that's yeah. the other part of it. They it's, yell amen extra loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're gonna make every bit of eye contact they can make. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's it's kind of funny how you 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 get both. Uh <laughs> but um so one of the reasons that I believe God allows some of the rejection as well, because it tests the motives of your heart. Mm. Yeah. Because if everybody was to celebrate you all the time for your revelation, then the motive of your heart could become something other than the glory of God. That's a great point. A great point. And yeah. so I believe God allows that to purify the motives of the heart. And prophetic people don't get so stuck on the rejection or who didn't receive you. Look at it as you're doing this for the glory of God. I think that's where some people mishandle it or miss it. Yeah. And you said something. Part, well, let me, I'll jump into this. Another part of it is, is your family. You, you mentioned the scripture, a prophet is not respected in his own hometown. Yeah. Luke 4, 24. Thanks, Illumination. They're probably going to be the last people <laughs> that honor you as a prophet, see you as a prophet, receive your revelation. And sometimes you may get worse for everybody else, but your family Lord may tell you nothing because he knows it's not going to go that far. Normally it may take years before they accept you as such, because look, they used to change your diapers. Right. They, they loaned you money when you didn't have money. Yeah. They, so they've seen the ugly side of you more than anybody, you know? So. Yes. So, so, but again, God uses all of that. He can turn all that around. And right. also it gives you a sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. That there's a place where you need to just be level <laughs> and not in the clouds always. And so that helps out. It helps to balance you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I want to talk about the question that you mentioned. How do how does a person know if a prophet is accurate? Well, yeah. and, and this kind of segues perfect. The difference between the Old Testament prophet and New Testament prophet is this. The, so in the Old Testament, only three people had the spirit of God upon them. The king, the priest, the prophet. When the king would get into office, the prophet would anoint him with oil, like Samuel anointing Saul or David. Mm -hmm. The prophet had the spirit upon him. And when he would say the word, the Lord came to him. Now, the Holy Spirit had not been given as far as the baptism or infilling of the Holy Spirit. So the the spirit. Holy Spirit was upon the prophet, but the Holy Spirit didn't come to live inside of us until after the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So I believe what would take place with the Old Testament prophet, they would almost audibly hear the word of the Lord. I believe when they heard it, it wasn't like we heard the inner voice of the Holy Spirit, the witness of the Holy Spirit. I believe they almost audibly heard this word of the Lord. And that's why there was no room for messing up. That's why they said if you came and prophesied in the name of the Lord and you you were false, go ahead and stone this person. <laughs> That's why as well, when the young prophet was told in the word of the Lord, go and do your prophetic assignment and on the way back, do not stop and talk to anyone. And the older prophet told him, the Lord told me you're to stop and to have Chick-fil-A sandwich with me. On a Sunday when Chick-fil-A's closed, that's not right. Mm -hmm. And he did it anyway. A lion came out and killed him <laughs> because he wasn't being led by, oh, I feel the Lord is saying, I hear the Lord is saying on this. He was he had heard the Lord strong enough 
that his disobedience opened the room, opened the door for the enemy to just take him out. Mm -hmm. The New Testament prophet, even though they may hear the word of the Lord that way at times, probably very few times, spread out. Mostly is hearing more so through the inner voice of the Holy Spirit. Even when the word of the Lord comes, I don't believe it's the same way exactly as they had it in the Old Testament. Mm. So I believe that there, and I got to be very careful how I said this. Amen. We have to give more grace to the New Testament prophet than the Old Testament prophet. Yeah. Because with prophetic ministry, there is revelation, interpretation, and delivery. In the New Testament. Let me give an example. I was praying with a young lady one time at my aunt's house and the Lord spoke to me and said she has an Adamus apple. And Jeff, I heard this thing so clear and I was about to say, I literally was about to say, I, I, I know your secret. You have an Adam's apple and you're trying to, you're trying to trick me or something, you know, and it's like, I was about to say it and something stopped me, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because I heard she has an Adam's apple. I wasn't, it's just, and I got quiet and I said, Lord, what, what did I do with this? And then I had this inner vision, closed vision of an apple tree and like Eve eating the apple and this download came. Now, I don't believe it was an apple tree in the Garden of Eden. That's just the imagery that we use. I don't believe sure. it was an apple tree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could have been mangoes. Could have been, you know. Uh, could have been something know. that's not existing Probably. today. You know, who knows? Not existing figs. Yeah. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. But anyway. Um, and the Lord was telling me that that tree represented when you ate from it, being able to discern between the knowledge of good and evil, even though it brought it, it was just a play on words and symbolism. So when the Lord said she had an Adam's apple, he then told me as I got quiet and listened to him, tell her that I've heard her prayers for discernment and she'll be able to discern between good and evil. And when I tell her this, she loses it because she had been praying for discernment. So interesting. I could have jumped out and pointed the finger at her and and, and my totally. revelation would have been accurate, but my interpretation and delivery would have been totally off. And that would yeah. have made me a false prophet, but it would have made my response to what I was receiving not proper. So, so I, is there is there a difference between because you said that would have made you a false prophet? Is there a difference between um misinterpreting a prophecy? So, so, okay, let me say it like this. Is there a difference between a false prophet and someone who just misinterpreted a prophecy that was given to them? So like, if you give a false prophet, a prophecy, does that automatically label you a false prophet or was it just that you misinterpreted or other people misinterpreted the prophecy you gave? It's that you misinterpreted or you just missed it. I've missed mm -hmm. it before. I've misinterpreted before. I miscommunicated before all of the misses. I'm sure I've done it at least once or twice. Yeah, I'm certain of it. You know, yeah. I think of Bob Jones, you know, he he gathered all these churches in, in Charlotte and in, in North Carolina and said, well, you guys need to pray and then intercede. You need to bind. You need to lose. We need to really war. I keep seeing the, the, these the Panthers are coming. The spirit of the Panthers coming. The demonic Panthers are coming. We need to bind this thing up. And the Lord said, the Lord said, no, stop praying. It was a Charlotte Panthers football team that was coming to Charlotte. It wasn't a principality. <laughs> so he has all these people warring and batting, and the Lord's like, no, stop. And he's like, why well, stop? He said, I'm going to it was a Charlotte Panthers football team that was coming to Charlotte. The Lord was just telling him the Panthers are coming. <laughs> so that doesn't make him a false prophet. That just yeah. makes a comical moment. So yeah. uh, I'll give you a, an example. I told someone recently there was an election before, or many elections, and I said, Lord, who's going to get the most votes? I just asked them casually in the house. Mm -hmm. I wasn't praying, sitting down. I wasn't even like my, my heavy prayer time. I was just casually saying it. I said, Lord, who's going to get the most votes? He told me one person. I said, okay. Later, I actually prayed about it. And I said, well, Lord, who's going to win this election? And even though I had heard, I was just asking again. And I heard something different. And I was like, Lord, that's different. And the Lord reminded me, the first time you asked me who's going to get the most votes, not who's going to win. Interesting. Because you can get the most popular votes and still not win. That's true. Right. So, yeah. so, so you made the assumption. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So all of these different factors factor in. 
Uh, now, a false prophet, I'm, I'm going to say what I feel a false prophet is. A false prophet is, number one, someone that's not even called to be a prophet. And they're trying to masquerade as a prophet. They don't have the calling. They don't have the gifts. They don't have the anointing. They just don't have what we call the stuff, period. Yeah. The second person I consider a false prophet is a real deal prophet that's been given over to filthy lucre. That's been given over to the occult or that they've allowed their heart to be corrupted by the enemy and they use the prophetic for manipulation control no. and no. for dubious means we look at Balaam. Balaam was a bad boy it, Be listen Balaam heard from god it was the real god talking to him our god Balaam was so powerful that he knew and they knew that he can curse an entire nation but Balaam erred in the corruption. He erred in greed that he allowed Balak the king to c contaminate his heart and to pull him into uh, using his gifting illegally. He kept going back and back. And then he gave him a way to get over on the children of Israel. So I believe that he moved into a realm of the false prophet. And so anytime that you're taking the prophetic and it's not really God speaking and you use it for manipulation, control, self-gain, all these type of things, people become false prophets. And if you go to some of these other countries, especially Africa, West Africa, especially, and I love people there. I got a lot mm -hmm. of friends there. Mm -hmm. They know that there are some people that masquerades as prophets and they're ministers of Satan. Yeah. I mean, they don't, they're, they don't they haven't had a born again experience they have some gifts working but they're coming out of another realm another mm. kingdom interesting yes and do you feel like so i'll give you uh sort of a, a quick story and then apply it to even the prophetic and i guess it could apply to anything within the church but when i was in film school there was a guy who um he really it was like he had romanticized the role of being like a writer director to where he's like, that's where my value is going to come from. But he was being unrealistic with himself in terms of the areas he needed to improve in. And maybe it was more that he just liked the idea of, Oh, if I'm a director, then I'll have this type of value. And so he kept being like, no, 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 this is what I'm supposed to do. But yet like everything he did was very haphazardly. And it was like, he just, I think he loved the idea of it. Another example would be like on American Idol where people come on who legit can't sing, but have convinced themselves, no, I am a singer. This is what I'm born to do. This is my calling. I know that I'm supposed to be up there with like, you know, millions of people in my audience and all this stuff. So it's this, del it's almost this delusion where they yes. romanticize the idea of becoming a singer. Do you feel like that can also apply to, to, a prophet because even last on the last episode when you were told that you know you're an apostle you were like like dug your heels in and you were like <laughs> Ugh. and because it's a serious thing like you're dealing yeah. with war for greater i mean yeah greater level of revelation but greater level of warfare as well like um <laughs> so do you get what i'm saying like do you feel like that also applies to even within the the, the prophetic where somebody might be a false prophet you're saying they're not even called to the office of a prophet um, yes, same kind of thing. Because this, from the outside, they're looking at it as you know they only see the ten percent. The person gets up in the podium, a platform. They're calling people out. They're giving this revelation, and and they see that they don't see the warfare. They don't see the rejection. They don't see you know the nights that you're dealing with, whatever God's dealing with you about. They don't see the cost. And there are people that romanticize being a prophet, an apostle, a pastor. You know, I know young women that would say this. I'm, I know I'm going to be a pastor's wife. Some people analyze being a pastor's wife. I don't know why you would want that headache and trouble if God didn't call you to it. But mm -hmm. there's people that romanticize positions or platforms or titles. And you know who, who God really uses? The people that really don't want it. <laughs> because yes. they're, they're, they don't have motive. It's yeah. the people that really don't want it. That they, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be transparent for the show. Mm -hmm. And August... I told my wife and I told uh, a young lady who's close to our family. She has the same last name, actually. And she's God parent for our kids. I said, 
I feel like I really would like a break. <laughs> mm. I feel like I would really like to just take a little off time and, and just do something else for a while. Yeah. You know what happened? Within a week, the Lord promoted me. There was a visitation from the Lord and he literally promoted me. And I was asking for a break because maybe if I was asking for more anointing, more authority, more rank, I wouldn't have got it. But I was asking for a break and he gave me the opposite. And when I say promoted me, <laughs> anyway, the stuff now that he's doing is greater than anything that we've had in our ministry thus far. And but I was at the point, I was like, Lord, I, I you know, I'm, of course, I'm going to serve the Lord and live right. But I was like, Lord, I, I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to be on flyers. I don't have to speak. I can just take a little break and I'll be OK. Just for a few months. It could be months. It don't have to be a year. And the Lord literally in a week promoted me after I had this conversation twice. So <laughs> God is like, there's my guy. Demonte's my guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So don't ask the Lord for a break. You need to do reverse psychology. Yeah, actually, for more <laughs> ministry, and then you would get a vacation. That's the, no, but yeah, like, he needs a break. Yeah, yeah, but the Lord looks at the motives of the heart. You know, yeah. I was really telling the Lord, Lord, there's more. There has to be more. I said there has to be more. You've hmm. shown me more. I've been waiting all these years for more. There has to be more. And you know, right now I can just take a break because I know that there's more. And it just was. I just wanted to see more for the body from the Lord. Yeah. And, uh, He's being faithful, but I was at the point of taking a break. So he looks yeah. at the motives of the heart. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really good. So we're almost out of time, but I wanted to actually, maybe we can end on this topic um, of now that we've kind of covered what a prophet is, all that stuff. I think that within the body of Christ, and I know this because I used to be this way. Um, and I know people who are still in this place is, um, you know, the Bible says to test test things right but there there's this point where there's a difference between testing stuff and being skept a skeptic and yes. skeptic. well i believe in prophecy but well i believe in miracles but and then every single time there's a, there's this doubt right so how what is the appropriate response to a, a prophetic word so if you're if you're finally if somebody's watching this and they're finally like okay fine i will i realize that you know like we kind of look what we talked about in the last episode but there's never going to be that you're never going to have enough revelation about something that it's not going to require some measure of faith and it definitely applies to prophecy um and so what is the appropriate response to a prophetic word, obviously, because you don't want to look at it and be like, well, I'm going to take every single prophetic word that anybody ever gives me and I'm just going to believe it. <laughs> uh, is, is that the appropriate response? Yeah. So like, what's the appropriate response to a prophetic word, Devante? Okay. So I want to say this before the prophetic word comes, preparation is necessary. And that preparation is to be full of the word of God. Mm. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword right. but it says it's a divider between soul and spirit mm -hmm. so when a prophetic word comes to you sometimes you can automatically know that it's not from god because it totally contradicts scripture if it totally contradicts scripture that just destroy it up right number two sometimes the word may not make sense to your mind but your spirit man will bear witness with it because you have enough word in you to attach to the word that's being released. Number three, take it and pray about it if you're uncertain. Uh, and then how does it make you feel on the inside? You know, I've had people to say that somebody prophesied to them and the whole time they were talking, the hairs on their neck stood up and they got an icky feeling. They got a yucky feeling. They walked away feeling sick. Maybe it could be a familiar spirit, somebody operating out of a different realm. You know, I've had prophetic words that the person gave me, gave it to me. I felt like it was off, but I felt good about the person and I felt a peace with the word. And we, did, we do something called putting it on the shelf. You're not saying that it's from God and you're not saying that it's not. You put it on the shelf until later. You know what happens? Three, four, five years later, I read that word and it's speaking right yeah. to the situation mm -hmm. and the now and it blows you away. Yeah. Um, so as well. When you receive a prophetic word, compare it to the other words that you receive. If you receive 10 words that you're called as an evangelist 
and somebody comes and prophesies that you're called as a airline pilot, I would probably go at the 10 words over the one, <laughs> given all yeah. things equal. You know, yeah. so uh, there's some yeah. different practical things you can do like that. But if it's a major word concerning a major life decision, a relationship, a geographical move, a major career change, being called into ministry, that's why you have leadership. And the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Go to your leadership and ask them what do they think. Ask them to pray with you and for you to help understand and navigate what the Lord is saying. Yeah. Well, I think for me too, one, th one thing that I do, like you were talking about, put it on the shelf. Like that's that. And then I think it's important too, to be a good steward of those prophetic words that you've been given. Like recently, yeah. actually, I'd gotten a series of prophetic words and I kind of like gotten in this, this mental trap again, where Satan was hitting me with something that God had spoken very clearly about. And I was praying and God was like, why aren't you, why aren't you listening to my, why aren't you listening to my words that I've given you? And it was like, it was a rebuke. And I was like, oh, and then I, I really felt strong. He's like, I want you to go and I want you to start writing down all these words. I want you to catalog. Them. I want you to archive them. And I want you to actually, because sometimes people will give you a prophetic word and sometimes a prophet is eight years in the future, right? Yes. So we are the ones a lot of times and sometimes, yes, people prophets will maybe they'll get in their flesh and they'll give you a time and it actually is inaccurate but doesn't mean the prophetic word is inaccurate it means the time stamp that they gave it was inaccurate and so there have been times where like i'll put something on a shelf and i so badly want it to be for right now and it's yes. not and so i'll get to that point and sometimes deep down i know i just i know that it's like a difference between like my spirit knowing and my flesh being like no but i want it now because i had not I'm not a fan of the situation that I'm in right now or whatever. Um, and so it doesn't mean that the pro prophet, the prophecy was wrong. I go, okay, this time has passed. I, I still, you know, my spirit, there's still, re it's still resonating within my spirit. So I know that it, it was from you, God, especially if it's a confirmation from a previous word somebody's given or consecutive words, but I'm going to keep it on the shelf and I'm going to continue to press forward with my hand on the plow, I'm going to keep going. And then, yeah, like you were saying, a couple of years will go by and you go, ah, here it is. So, so yeah. I was reaching down because when you said a good steward of words, I was reaching down to grab something under my desk. And then you actually said it. The Lord says, record them. Prophetic words from 2000. I don't know if you can read it. 2009 to 2013. Wow. Okay. Let me get in the camera. View yeah, check that. that out. Typed up, dated. I can tell you the name of the person that gave it, what ministry they attached to, if they gave it by phone or email, and what they said. And then this is another year that's not in. And so sometimes when I'm seeking the Lord, I go back and just randomly read a few words, just open it up, read it. And it'll be speaking to my right now. It'll be the pieces to the puzzle. It'll be what God already spoke. It'll be, I mean, it'll be just spot on. And it'll also yeah. help you to get direction on how to pray and what to seek God for. Yeah. You know, sometimes really you go into prayer and you be like, what did I even talk to God about today? But if you look back at some of the past prophetic words, it gives you a framework. And especially, let's say it's 2020, well, it's 2022. If you were to go 2025 and look at 2022 words, you will see more of the big picture over time of what God has been doing with you and kind of give you more of a, a streamline of where to put your faith, your focus and your prayers. So yeah. that's a powerful insight, Jeff. Yeah. And also too, I think even when, as you write them down, sometimes I'll get more revelation. I, I get a, I'll get a vision. I'll get, you know, something else that, um, yeah. And then, or as you're writing them down, you'll start to see the bigger picture of what God is is doing. And that's kind of what happened when I started being more diligent about writing these things down. So, yeah. um, and sometimes it's even like, it can be a really powerful word, but you're like, oh yeah, this is actually just God confirming a word that was given to me four years ago. And God's reminding me to stay the course that I'm headed in the right direction. So yeah, yeah. great, 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 great. Um, okay, DeMonte, would you mind just praying for people to close us out? Yes. 
Father, we thank you today for the teaching. We thank you for the revelation. And we pray in Jesus' mighty name that you will cause the prophets to arise, that you'll cause the prophetic people to arise. Yes. Let them arise in wisdom and love and let them move in accuracy, God, of your heart and your mind. And we pray, God, that as people open up the word to delve into this ministry and look into this ministry, that you will give them a clear understanding of his purpose and of his function, and that you will help us all, oh God, to function properly with the prophetic gifts and the prophetic mm -hmm. ministry. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Demonte, how can people follow you and all the goodness that you are doing? They can follow me on uh, Facebook, Demonte Edmonds, or at Demonte TV on Instagram or Facebook. And those are the places they can hit me up. Awesome. Demonte, thank you so much. You're the man. We'll do this again for part three <laughs> next Monday. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah, Good to be absolutely. here with you. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody, God that's God. our show. Have an amazing Monday. Join us Tuesday. Bye, Demonte. Um, join us Tuesday. Let's see. That's going to be November 15th with Krista Elisha. So tomorrow, my good friend, your, you know, you know her, you love her. She's going to be great. She'll, she'll be on tomorrow morning with me or tomorrow afternoon with me. Sorry, we're recording this in the morning. I'm all confused. Okay. Uh, so at 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Also, there is a donation link at the end, ElijahFire.com slash donate and any and all donations you give whether that's one dollars whether that's five whether that's 20 200 3 million you know what i'm saying uh that all goes to this to make sure that it stays free accessible on as many platforms as we can manage also a lot of that money is also going to go towards building freshwater wells for people in uganda as well as stateside. We've got a lot of really cool things in development here stateside as well. So uh, tune in tomorrow, 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time with Krista Elisha. And we'll see you then. Bye.